I will be discussing the burden of skin cancer in the United States. Uh, the National Institute of Aging um, calls the aging of our population in the United States the silver tsunami for which we are very unprepared. By 2035, the U.S. Census Bureau estimates that the geriatric population will outnumber children in the United States for the first time in our country's history. And you can see from their beautiful infographic here that the, the shape of the demographics of the United States are, is changing from a, py a pyramid with relatively few um, geriatric patients compared to children to a pillar where it's almost the same in every strata of age. So across the board, uh, more than 50% of all cancers are diagnosed in patients age 65 and older. And by 2030, that proportion is expected to increase to 70%. So an aging population with more skin cancer is only going to add to the current burden of skin cancer that, that we all are facing in our clinics on a day-to-day -day basis. And anyone who knows a uh, dermatologist or, or anyone who's been to a Mohs surgeon knows that skin cancer is ubiquitous. Uh, one in five Am Americans will develop skin cancer by the age of 70. And a recent review in JAMA Dermatology took a, a really interesting look at the risk of skin cancer with age and found that for patients between 65 and 79 years, they have about a three times higher risk of developing skin cancer than someone below 65. And as you go above 80, the risk is about five times higher. So again, this is just proving that skin cancer is almost ubiquitous. Everyone will be uh, in touch with someone or everyone will be a victim of skin cancer at some point. All of this leads to a huge annual cost of treatment of skin cancer. Over $8 billion alone in 2016, uh, the most recent year for which we have these figures. Um, that cost is broken down to about $5 billion for non-melanoma skin cancer and over $3 billion for melanoma. And any dermatologist can tell you the risk factors for uh, skin cancer are a life well lived. So we know that the risk increases with age because of multiple factors. Um, everyone accumulates more UV exposure resulting in DNA damage. But endogenous aging also leads to DNA stress and immune senescence allows for uh, the development of skin cancer and the progression of skin cancer at a faster and faster rate. Besides age, there are other risk factors, acute UV toxicity, sunburns, um, immunosuppression from transplants or other medical comor comorbidities, and neglect um, all increase the risk of skin cancer and advanced skin cancer. So we know that solar radiation is the cause of the majority of skin cancers that we see, over 90% of non-melanoma skin cancer and 86% of melanoma. This is not fake news. This is incontrovertible fact. Um, using sunscreen with an SPF of 15 or higher reduces the risk of squamous cell skin cancer by 40% and melanoma by 50%. Um, and an individual's risk of melanoma doubles after five sunburns. Knowing all of this, it's really sad to see that our uh, patients' use of sunscreen isn't changing. People aren't using sunscreen much more than they were before. Um, and that tells us that we're sort of failing at our job in, in preventing skin cancers. Um, in addition to sun exposure uh, with UV damage, um, we also know that indoor tanning is, uh, is definitely related to skin cancer. Um, it, over 419,000 cases of skin cancer uh, annually are linked to indoor tanning at a direct cost of about $343 million. Um, tanning 10 times in your life increases your risk of melanoma by 34%. The more you tan, the younger you tan, the higher your risk is. So tanning just once increases your risk of squamous cell by 67%, basal cell by 29%. If you tan before the age of 40, your risk of basal cell goes up by 69%. And if you tan before 35, your risk of melanoma goes up by 75%. So um, we would all be well served to keep our patients out of tanning beds. Um, the World Health Organization classifies tanning beds as a class one device um, related to the development of cancer. Other class one uh, agents include cigarettes and plutonium. So clearly we need to do something more to prevent our children 
and uh, anyone really from using indoor tanning beds. Brazil and Australia have already outlawed them and across the European Union and in Canada, um, patients under 18 can't use a tanning bed unless they have a prescription from their doctor. Um, but in the US, a, about 30 states still allow uh, virtually unfettered access to tanning beds. So um, one point of action is that we can work with our uh, legislative arms to, to get those rules changed and, and prevent our children from using indoor tanning beds. Immunosuppression is also a risk for the development of advanced skin cancer. Uh, we know that transplant patients who we see in dermatologist's office um, know more about skin cancer. They, they better understand uh, how to protect yourself from the sun. They better understand the causal relationship between the sun and skin cancer. We know that they use sunscreen more. We know that they use sun protective clothing more um, compared to patients who don't come to see a dermatologist. However, uh, despite all of that, they still across the board don't, transplant patients across the board don't use sun protection like they should. So we're still seeing transplant patients come in 10 years after their transplant with multiple skin cancers and, and say that they were never educated about the risks of skin cancer. And again, this is something that dermatologists uh, or any physician can work with our, our partners and our colleagues to educate them and educate our parent, patients about the risk of skin cancer. Neglect of skin cancer is also unfortunately common and it's especially relevant in patients who um, come from a low socioeconomic status. Uh, if they have cognitive impairment or functional impairment, if they have mood disorders, and if they have a lack of social support. These allow small, simple basal cell skin cancers to turn into large tumors. Dr. Vitimus later this morning will show some great photos um, and talk about the, the treatment of, of advanced basal cells. And this delayed diagnosis increases the tumor burden for these patients. So it leads to increased local tissue destruction, which leads to more symptoms and a lower quality of life. It also leads to disfigurement from the treatment of the skin cancer with major surgical defects, um, flap closures, which can, can really alter their perception of themselves, their quality of life. And in some cases, it can lead to infection or death, um, which is obviously something that we need to do a better job at preventing. Uh, Non-melanoma skin cancer, uh, a, a few statistics, more than 5.4 5 million non-melanoma skin cancer were treated in over 3.3 million patients in 2012. Uh, between 1994 and 2014, the diagnosis and treatment of skin cancer, in, of non-melanoma skin cancers increased about 77%. So non-melanoma skin cancers are not reportable conditions, so we, we don't have definite facts. There's not a great SEER database. Uh, but we can use Medicare claims data to really dive down and investigate how, um, how many of these procedures are happening. So if you look over the past 15 years, this study that was just published in the JAD earlier this year um, shows that procedures are increasing. The number of patients on Medicare who are getting biopsies is going up to almost 5 million in 2015. Um, the, the number of treatments is around 2.5 million, um, which is a, an ever-increasing number. And, and anytime you see something that is on that line, you know you have to do something about it. A little bit of good news, um, the rate of growth is slowing. So when you adjust for the number of beneficiaries, um, about 10% of Medicare patients are getting a skin biopsy annually. Um, and about ha uh, half of that, or about 5%, are being diagnosed with a skin cancer uh, and getting some sort of treatment procedure. So at least the rate of growth is slowing. There's some hope. Not a lot of hope, but there's some hope. Um, advanced basal cell skin cancer, whether it's locally advanced or metastatic, affects about 31,000 patients per year. So 31,000 patients is about one-tenth of 1% 1 of all basal cells, so not very common. Fortunately, um, our understanding of the treatment of locally advanced and metastatic basal cells has, has evolved greatly over the past few years. There are now two targeted treatments that are currently available on the market, bismotigib and sonitigib. However, both of these medications are extremely expensive, um, over $10,000 a month for each of those medicines. Um, to put that into a little bit of context, 
the biologic medicines for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis that we commonly use cost on about two to two and a half thousand per month. So these are much more expensive than the biologics. Um, fortunately, they're not used that frequently, um, but the rising cost of um, medical treatments um, is definitely playing into the burden of skin cancer um, on our healthcare system. Switching gears a little bit to talk about melanoma, um, in 2018, there were over 175,000 new diagnoses of melanoma. Uh, the majority of those are thin melanoma, with about 87,000 melanoma in situ and 91,000 invasive melanoma. Again, the majority are, are thin melanomas. Um, unfortunately, melanoma is still a relatively deadly skin cancer. One person per hour dies of melanoma in the United States. Um, Melanoma remains the most common cancer in young men, um, and it's the third most common cancer in young women. So uh, despite our knowledge about the increasing risk of melanoma, we're still not doing a very good job at preventing them or reducing the risk. Fortunately, um, Dr. Funchain will, will tell us about the recent rapid advances in the treatment of melanoma. Um, We've, we kind of understand this a lot more now. Science Magazine uh, denoted targeted therapies and immunotherapies as the breakthrough of the year a few years ago. Um, and our rapid expansion in knowledge of tumor biology and immunology are really revolutionizing the treatment of advanced melanoma. So now, in addition to um, stage four melanoma, agents are approved for the treatment of stage three and stage four melanoma with uh, survival benefits for patients with 3B and 3C melanoma. Um, unfortunately, the cost of these treatments is also uh, extraordinarily expensive. So um, a recent estimate projects about a million dollars of cost per patient for a treatment with a checkpoint inhibitor. So um, again, these medicines are, are life-saving. They give hope to patients who didn't have hope uh, if they had metastatic or advanced melanoma, um, but they come at a significant cost, and something needs to be done to drive down the cost. So when you evaluate all of the different available therapies um, and you estimate how much time you're gaining for your patients and then you divide the cost by that estimate, um, you can see that some of the new combination therapies are up to $19,000 per month of life that you're gaining. So um, I'm certainly not advocating for uh, not using these medicines. I think something needs to be done to reduce the cost of these medicines. The United States Preventative Services Task Force recently updated its consensus statement on the primary prevention of skin cancer and on self-skin exams. So they told us basically after reviewing the evidence that there's only a moderate benefit for behavioral counseling for patients who are between six months and 24 years. Above 24 years, there's only mild benefit for behavioral counseling in terms of reducing their risk to sun exposure. And they still haven't found adequate evidence to recommend self-screening exams um, compared to the harms associated with them. Um, there are a few things that I think we can do better to, to help them change their minds about that. So the demographics of the United States are changing, um, and using the term fair skin or light skin um, might not apply to everyone anymore. Um, June Robinson wrote a great editorial in JAMA that suggests that we all switch to using the term sun-sensitive skin. Um, our, it's our evidence base that drives the U.S. PSTF to make their recommendations. Um, and their recommendations influence policy, and that influences public attitudes and behaviors. So if you are doing research or you're writing about skin cancer or you're counseling your patients, start using the term sun-sensitive skin instead of fair skin or light-complected. Some people can even be offended if you call them light skin, um, and you certainly don't want to do that. But switching to sun-sensitive skin captures more patients who might be at risk for skin cancer. So ask specifically about sunburn history. And once you've, once you've found a patient who's had a sunburn, then you start to assess for risk of melanoma by the, by the history and physical exam. We need to rely more on social networks, lowercase s, not, not Facebook. Um, rely on social networks to maximize the spread of information among relatives and friends of patients who are at risk for skin cancer. So patients listen 
or patients will talk about their experience and their relatives and their family will listen to them more than our, a lot of our patients will listen to us. So if you can convince one person, that will spread amongst their, their kinship network um, and you can get the information out much more uh, effectively. Sun protection starts early. So um, obviously you can't tell a six month old to start wearing sunscreen, but you can convince their parents that they need to be uh, vigilant about it from an early age. Um, but unfortunately, in our schools, teachers and school administrators don't recognize the importance of sun safety as part of healthy behavior. Um, sun protection wasn't listed as one of the top three um, quote-unquote healthy behaviors in a recent study. Um, students in many schools aren't allowed to self-apply sunscreen, um, and in order to decrease teacher-to-student contact, um, schools often provide spray sunscreens, which are sprayed in, in children's eyes um, and inhaled, which has negative health effects, potentially has negative health effects down the line. Um, in addition, they also are trying to, tr to apply the sunscreen to a number of children all at once, so they don't use an adequate amount of sunscreen. Um, they don't uh, know about the UV index, so the first day of spring, everyone sends their kid outside, um, even though those are the days with the highest UV index and patients are more likely to burn during those times. So educating our, our students about um, the UV index and how to reduce the risk of sunburns is still very important. Um, in addition, the majority of derm patients don't have the adequate knowledge about sun protection and they're not offered counseling when they come to dermatologist's office. So we need to do a better job of using those AAD handouts to talk about sun protection, um, use our, um, the whole healthcare team to educate people about how to appropriately use sunscreen, how often you have to reapply. So I think there are a few interventions that we have available to us to help to stem the rising tide of skin cancer. So um, we do need to advocate for the use of the UV index to determine outdoor time. Um, strictly relying on temperature um, and, and weather conditions is inappropriate um, to help guide people to make safe choices. Um, we can lobby our social networks, capital S this time, to, to put UV index right next to temperature on their um, homepage so people will be more uh, inclined to look at it and use that to guide when they want to go outside when they don't. Um, we need to be better in dermatology offices at targeting teenagers, young adults, and the parents of young children to change sun exposure patterns. Um, targeting older people who already are developing skin cancer might be helpful, but only because we can rely on them to use their kinship networks to teach the younger people. Most people above the age of 24 don't change their behavior uh, based on the USPSTF's recent report. Um, we need to select the patients at the highest risk. So find people who have sun sensitive skin, who have other risk factors for skin cancer, and really hone down on them teach them, screen them, teach them to screen themselves. That's, I think, where we'll find the most benefit for uh, secondary prevention of skin cancer, finding them at the earliest possible stage. We need to educate our patients and, and more importantly, educate our colleagues about proper sun protection and where to find more information. Um, this, I think, is key. We can't, we're obviously very overburdened. We have very busy clinics. You can't spend three minutes talking about sun protection to every patient that comes in the room. But we can work with our primary care physicians to teach them to talk to people. We don't see nearly as enough pediatric patients uh, to make a difference across the board. So telling our pediatricians how to counsel their patients, where to find more information, giving them handouts, I think can make a huge, a huge change. And we obviously need to collaborate with transplant physicians, lymphoma, leukemia physicians, and HIV clinics to evaluate at-risk patients. Um, any immunosuppression does increase your risk for skin cancer. We need to capture those people before they get to the advanced um, or metastatic stage. Um, and certainly we need to optimize the treatment of patients with advanced non-melanoma skin cancer and melanoma to select the best patients for those expensive medications. And we need to work with uh, Congress and other legislative bodies to help drive down the cost of prescription medications.